Hello and welcome to the short read workshop day one video for creating sequencing libraries. So I wanted to start with how to design a sequence experiment. There's factors involved that are similar to designing other types of experiments like number of replicates, money, number of conditions, and what you expect to get out of your experiment. But something that is unique to sequencing experiments is read depth and read depth is integral to how you design a sequencing experiment and it interconnects with all of these other things. I'm going to go further into this in a future video, but I want you to think about it as I define read depth and as I talk about how to create libraries and how sequencing works. So just some very basic terminology that you may already know. A library is a collection of DNA or cDNA that you've created from RNA that is ready to put on the sequencing machine. A read is a fixed length output sequence that you get from the sequencing machine, whether it's 50 bases, 75 bases, 125 bases, or potentially something different. It's still going to be a fixed length output and all of your reads are going to be exactly the same length. Your depth is the number of reads that you get output from a sequencer. So for example, from an Illumina NextSeq, you get usually somewhere between 300 and 400 million reads. And that is split among all of the samples that you put onto that sequencing run. So now I'm gonna talk about the anatomy of a library. A library is a set of double-stranded DNA, but each of the molecules has these specific components on them. The P5, P7 ends are the ends that attach to an Illumina sequencing flow cell. So the flow cell has a lawn of oligonucleotides that are complementary to these P5, P7 ends. So you flow the DNA across the flow cell and those are the ends that attach. The indexes are used for multiplexing samples. They're also called barcodes. So it has a unique sequence that can be used to identify each sample or each molecule, depending on the type of sequencing that you're doing. Then you can mix all of those molecules together, sequence them all at once, and then deconvolute later exactly what sequences belong to what samples. The R1 and R2 primers are your sequencing primers for the Illumina sequencing reaction. And then the inserts are your actual DNA or cDNA of interest that are from your samples. When we talk about adapters, adapters are basically the P5 or P7 index and primer segments that you add onto your inserts. So most people talk about libraries as inserts with adapters added onto them. Then a read is the sequenced portion of your insert. It goes from the primer a fixed length into your insert. So you don't normally sequence your entire insert. You normally sequence just a fixed length on either side, whether one side or both sides of your insert, unless you have very small inserts depending on your library creation. So then talking about creating libraries, this is a very broad strokes overview of what library creation is. Depending on your protocol or your library kit, some of these steps might look a little different, but most library preps involve all of these steps at one point or another, even if they're not quite in this order. So you start with your samples where you have your DNA RNA extraction, and then anything that you do to that, depending on what your protocol is, whether it's reverse transcription of RNA, whether it's enrichment, like in ChIP-seq, enriching by a protein with an antibody, or run-on in terms of nascent RNA sequencing, anything that you need to do to your DNA RNA, and then you get a set of either DNA or cDNA. If you just sequenced this, you would get, you would miss a lot of the middles of these DNA fragments. So you normally fragment, whether it's in this step or some somewhere in your protocol, you fragment based on sonication or some other method in order to get a shorter set of inserts that you can get a more diverse range of reads that will hopefully cover all of the regions that you need to.
Sometimes you might want to add in spikens, which are exogenous DNA. If you're using human, it could be Drosophila DNA. It could also be luciferase or some kind of commercially available exogenous DNA. But it allows you to normalize exactly how much DNA you have, and you want to do it before you add adapters and amplify your libraries. After you have a fragmented library with or without spikens, you're going to add adapters. There's a variety of ways to do this using different types of enzymes, depending on your library preparation kit, if you have one, or your protocol. You might do this in a couple different ways, but you're going to then have sets of molecules that have inserts and adapters on either side, and that's pretty much ready for sequencing. Most of the time, you're also going to do a PCR amplification step, maybe only a couple cycles, maybe more than that, depending on what you're looking for, in order to get enough molecules for efficient sequencing. So there's a couple quality control questions that go into this. Not all of these are problems, but there are places that you might need to troubleshoot your library preparation step. There could be contamination in your library, whether it's organismal, say you have bacteria in your cells and you're also going to amplify that bacterial DNA and stick that into your library and sequence that. You can also have nucleic acid contamination. The most common example of this is if you're doing RNA-seq, you're going to have a lot of ribosomal RNA, much more than any other RNA that you're looking for. So there's some ways that you can either deplete ribosomal RNA or enrich for the RNA that you're looking for. But we consider in an RNA-seq experiment, ribosomal RNA to be a nucleic acid can contaminant that we don't want to sequence. You can also have adapter contamination. You can have adapter dimers that aren't actually attached to any inserts. And that's something that you can assess before you stick on your library onto a sequencer. You also need to think about your insert size. And this depends on your protocol, what's actually appropriate. So you might have small inserts if you're doing microRNA sequencing. But for example, a normal RNA-seq library would probably have inserts between 200 and 800 base pairs something on that order, and they would be fairly broadly distributed within that. So depending on your protocol, you need to figure out what your insert size is and see if your library actually matches that before you put it on a sequencing machine. Another point of troubleshooting might be base diversity, which is the mixture of nucleotides at a given position. This is hard to prepare for other than making sure that your indexes are relatively well distributed in terms of base diversity. But it is something that could be a problem in your sequencing run that you might need to come back and think about. Another thing to think about is complexity, which is how unique each insert in your library is. And this is very protocol dependent. Some libraries aren't going to have a lot of unique reads in them. But in other libraries, a low complexity library is a sign that perhaps you've done PCR over amplification, or there's some kind of bias in how your library has been processed. And then the last thing is concentration or quantification of your library, which is something you can assess in a variety of ways and is something your sequencing core should be able to help you with. So this concludes our library preparation and library QC video.